Hello and welcome. I have a very special topic today. Today I want to talk about stage fright and the fear of public speaking. I have personal experience with these things. As some people say they never experience it. I don't know anything about that. Uh, I experience stage fright when I have to stand up and speak in front of my office. I mean, I, I, it's just, it's just a, normal, uh, a normal experience for me. Uh, Barbara Streisand is, is famous for her bouts with stage fright. Johnny Carson said that before he went out to do a monologue, every single night he had anxiety. <clears throat> One time, you know, he was very famous for bringing magicians on and for bringing comedians on, and he gave a lot of people their start. And uh, one time he showed what was going on in the, in the waiting room when the comedian was waiting to come out. And, and he was quite sick back there. And then he walked on and he did a fantastic performance. Um, a great many people suffer from stage fright. And as you probably know, you've heard the cliches. Uh, many people say that, that they fear public speaking more than they fear death. So it's a, it's a big problem. And I want to give you, um, maybe not all the answers, but I want to give you some of my thoughts on the subject and uh, my experiences and how it's impacted my career and some of the coping mechanisms that I've come up with. I don't, you know, I, I, I don't want to call this uh, conquering stage fright or conquering the fear of public speaking or mastering these things uh, because I don't feel myself the master of them. I'm not sure that anybody is who actually experiences it. I was, I was watching a lecture recently, a mentalist lecturing, the guy's from Britain, uh, Ian is his name, and he claims that he never experiences stage fright uh, or, or the fear of public speaking. He can't wait to get out and perform. And honestly, I, I wish I was like that, but I'm not. I, I mean, I, I, uh, I get excited about what I'm doing. I really want to do it, but Every single time, every single time, I, I, uh, I end up with stage fright. And what do you do about it? Uh, fear, first of all, fear can be debilitating. Stage fright, the fear of public speaking, at the end of the day, it's fear. How do you deal with anxiety? How do you deal with fear? Uh, Zig Ziglar actually said this. False expectations that appear to be real. He said that's what fear is false expectations. Most of the time, the things that go on in our minds that cause us anxiety never actually happen. We go through it, we do it, and the thing that we feared never comes about. That's why Zig Ziglar calls it a false expectation. Fear, F-E-A-R, false expectations that appear to be real. But, you, you know, when, when you are faced with a public speaking opportunity, and sometimes your career might depend on it. Or sometimes the next step might depend on it. Or the pay raise, or whatever it might be. It's an important obligation. <clears throat> you know, you, you've got a crossroads. You can feel that fear and you can do it anyway, or you can be debilitated by that fear. Uh, and I think, I think so many people have chosen not to advance in their career or not to go in this direction or that direction because it involves public speaking. I know people that decided not to do certain things in school, in college, in graduate school because it involved public speaking. I know people that have avoided career paths because it involved public speaking. So, so this is a problem. Uh, fear, any kind of fear, but especially the fear of public speaking, can stand between you and success, or between you and your dreams, between you and making that dream a reality. And when that happens, it, it's terrible, it's a tragedy. <clears throat> and I gotta tell you, it's happened to me. It's happened to me. Uh, so, and I, I do wanna tell you a little bit about my story. You know, I, I've been doing magic since I was eight years old. I remember going in front of my, uh, my third grade class and doing the, the, the whole magic kit that I got for Christmas that year. And of course, the, there was another kid in the class who had, I've told that story before. Uh, but that was my first magic experience. And then, and then later when I was a teenager, 
uh, I started doing shows for, for birthday parties, kids shows. And, and I loved doing that. And, and as, as time went on, I, I began to acquire larger and larger props and I got a bigger and bigger show and I eventually did a full scale illusion show. And then when my assistant Jill, my partner Jill, uh, left the show, I tried to replace her, but I could not replace her. And I ended up uh, focusing on mentalism. And that's kind of my story in a nutshell. But I want to take you back to, I, I think it was, it was during the 90s. In the 1990s, I was doing a wide variety of shows. I was beginning to do corporate shows. And, you know, you hear that in the business quite a bit. Corporate shows. Uh, they tend to pay well, and that's why you hear a lot about them. What that means is that a company is hiring you to come in and entertain their employees or to do something on behalf of their employees. Uh, and sometimes it's a close-up type of thing, walking around the tables during a cocktail hour, and sometimes it's a full-scale show, and sometimes it's a hospitality suite. Sometimes it's a trade show. You're representing them on, on a, in a trade booth. But at any rate, uh, uh, many magicians want to gravitate toward that marketplace because, uh, because it's more lucrative. I was beginning to get these types of shows and uh, the associations and trades were getting to know me a little bit. Agents still weren't calling. But I was starting to get, let's put it this way, shows were coming to me. Which is, which is what you want. You don't want to be sitting on the phone all the time. You don't want to be doing constant uh, mail campaigns. Uh, you want shows to be coming to you. And, and, uh, and at this particular moment in my history, uh, shows were beginning to come to me. And some of those shows were high profile and they were pretty important. And, and I got to tell you, I, I collapsed. Now, I was, I was in my 30s. I guess my early 30s, mid 30s, and uh, I, I really didn't have the perspective that I have now. You know, I th thankfully as I've gotten a little bit older, uh, I I'm not going to say that I care less. I don't care less, but the care that I have isn't debilitating the way it was back then. But here's what happened: uh, the shows were coming in, and and I had the opportunity really to, to, it was a turning point. I could, I could take those shows and I could keep going and, and literally go professional or I, or not. And I, I you know, to this day, I regret, I, I had a number of magician friends that were back up for me. If something happened, if I had two shows on the same date, uh, any number of things could go wrong. I would call on these people. They would step in for me and vice versa. They would call on me. I'd step in for them. I think you need that when you're in this kind of a business. You, you, you know, you, you can't do every show and we get sick just like everybody else. I know Houdini was performing with a fever the night he died. Uh, not the night he died because he died later, but, but in that last tragic show, uh, he was running a pretty high fever. And of course, you know, the show must go on. And, and I believe in that. But there are times when you can't do a show and you need somebody to, to call on and they need to step in for you and you need to do the same for them. And, uh, and, and we do that. But instead of calling on these people to fill in for me because I couldn't do it for legitimate reasons, I called on them to fill in for me because I was, I was experiencing debilitating stage fright or fear of pug speaking, if you will. And, and I, to this day, I look back on that period and think, what if? And that's a shame. And that's what fear can do to you if you let it. It can derail your dream. It can derail you from what you want to do. Now, let me, let me tell you a little bit about, about what I was experiencing. So you have some idea. Now, you know, I don't want to get too gross here, but I have medical diagnoses that uh, uh, stomach disorders, basically. And so maybe my situation's a teeny bit worse, but you know, I, I'm not going to even get, give it that. It's, it's, we all experience stage, most of us do. And we all have to deal with it. It's just something we have to deal with. Uh, but, but I was pretty ill and what I would generally experience, you know, I, I, first of all, I was excited to get a show. I, I was always excited to get the show and, and I was always prepared. You know, I was always one who believed in rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. 
And I want to talk a little bit about the difference between practice and rehearsal. Uh, rehearsal is when you, when you go through the show and you don't take breaks and you don't stop and make notes and stuff like that. You go through the show as if you were performing. And I have a very vivid imagination. One of the things that makes me a great writer is that I, I have a very vivid imagination. And uh, so I, I am able to, in my rehearsal space, I am able to visualize the audience. And to the extent that I know the demographics of the audience, to the extent that I know who the audience is, I can, I can visualize their reactions in my rehearsal space. So, so it, it is, for me, it's, rehearsal is very much like performing. Uh, when I get to that performance space, I'm just going through what I've rehearsed. Uh, so it, it's not about, for me, it wasn't about not being rehearsed or not being prepared, uh, which it is for a lot of people. I'm going to talk about that too. Uh, a lot of anxiety comes when you're not prepared, and justly so. Uh, you need to be prepared. But no, it wasn't that at all. I just, uh, my anxiety would begin to build as showtime approached, as the day approached. And, uh, you know, I, I've always worked another job. And so typically I would take off on show days if, if they're during the week. Now, a lot of show days are Friday nights or they're Saturdays or Sundays. But a lot of show days are Wednesday afternoon, too, or Wednesday night. It depends on who you're working for. <coughs> but but I found that I could not I could not focus on my day job if my anxiety was driving me nuts. So, uh, so I would take off and I'd go through this ritual. And, um, and there were certain things I could eat or could not eat the day before. I'm going to talk about diet as well because it's very important. Um, but over a period of time, I learned that, you know, you want to eat certain types of foods. You want to avoid certain other types of foods because they're going to impact you, uh, especially you have stomach problems. And then the day of the show, um, you know, I'd start with my stomach issues early in the morning and it would get worse as the day goes on. And so by the time showtime came around, I was dehydrated and de depleted and, and it was just a mess. So I was actually experiencing physical illness uh, uh, when I would perform. And then after the show, I'd feel much better. I'd feel relieved and I, I did a good show and everybody liked it. It was great. Uh, but then I would, I would have uh, literally flu symptoms and sometimes even a fever. So, I mean, it was, it was bad. And, uh, and, but I allowed, I allowed this to derail my career. And, and I don't want you to do that. I've learned a few things over the decades and I want to share these things with you. Um, I started public speaking, not, I mean, I've been doing performance magic forever. But I started seriously studying public address when I was in college. You know, they have classes in college on speech communication. Take them. It doesn't matter what your career focus is. You might be an engineer. You might be an accountant. It doesn't make any difference. You need to know how to speak in public. You really do. So if you have the opportunity to take a class, take it. And there's lots of uh, career track and career path and all these other uh, uh, business training companies offer speech communication classes. Take them. Get out there and do it. Uh, you're going to hear different approaches to public speaking. <clears throat> One of the things I want to recommend to you, uh, I was, I was a, I'm a past president of Valley Toastmasters. Valley Toastmasters is my local Toastmasters group. If you've never heard of Toastmasters, I'm going to put their link down below. Speaking of links, folks, um, subscribe. Please subscribe. Hit the subscribe button. Put some comments down below. Ask me questions about this presentation. Let me respond to you. Let me know what you'd like to see more of. Put it down below in the comments uh, because I want to make videos that meet your needs. Uh, I really do. I enjoy doing this. I'm doing it for lots of reasons, but... If you can give me some direction, I'd appreciate it. So do that. And I'm going to put Valley, Valley Toastmasters and, and the Toastmasters International links below so that you can access them. It is the single best. Now, let me tell you something. I have, I've been taking and studying speech communication and taking classes and seminars for 30, 40 years. Valley Toastmasters has the best program to develop speakers that I've ever seen. 
uh, you get involved in this, you you won't be you won't be stretched too far. I mean, I I've been d delivering speeches that ninety minute speeches, sixty minute speeches. Uh, I've been delivering these speeches for years and years and years, and decades. And at this point in my life, speech communication comes fairly easily to me. Performance is still a little bit of a struggle, and I want to make a distinction between the two. But Toastmasters will give you the foundation you need to succeed. It will do it in an environment that is encouraging, that is, uh, that is, that is supportive. You will make friends, you will make contacts, you will develop as a speaker, and you won't regret it. So um, take advantage of the Toastmasters in your local area, get involved, and they will help you. So, so that's a little bit about my background. I, I've been a student of public address for a long time. I think I'm a good public speaker and I'm a comfortable public speaker. I think I do a better job uh, speaking than I do performing. <clears throat> and there are reasons for that. I, I want to make a distinction now between performance art and public speaking. Let me tell you something, and, and this is another thing. I, I mentioned Valley Toastmasters. I mentioned the Toastmasters International Groups. You can find a local Toastmaster wherever you are in the entire world. So there's no reason to not be involved in Toastmasters. But let me make a little pitch for performance magic at this point. If you can do performance magic, if you can get out in front of an audience and perform a 15-minute show, a 30-minute show, and that's how you start, by the way. Do not start with an hour. Don't do that. If you've never done it before, uh, get involved with uh, Society of American Magicians or International Brotherhood of Magicians or a, a group of performers. This is how comedians do it, folks. Uh, they do open mic nights. They, they get involved in, with other comedians and they work on their material together. And it's a safe and supportive environment before you're out there in front of the general public. Uh, so, so that's what I would encourage you to do. But here's why I'm encouraging, whatever your profession is, whatever your desires or ambitions, if you can do an act, uh, 15 minutes, if you can do an act, you can speak in public. I mean, it's so much more difficult to do an act, whether it's com comedy or magic or whatever it is, it's so much more difficult to do an act than it is to deliver a speech. That by the time you've done all the preparation and all the rehearsal and all the practice and everything that goes in, the blocking and the, and the, uh, the, 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 the re-editing and the, the writing and the memorizing and all that goes into performance art, by the time you've done that and you've done it successfully, preparing and delivering a speech will be easy by comparison. So that's, that's one of the advantages of getting involved in the performance art is that by comparison, it makes everything else easy. So anyway, that, that's my pitch for you. If you're not a magician currently, you never thought about it, you're not a comedian, you know, give that some thought uh, because it'll make you a better public speaker. It'll make you a more comfortable public speaker. Uh, you'll get, you'll, you know, you'll think, oh, you know what, I don't have to worry about prop management. I don't have to worry about audience management during this particular routine. I can just deliver my speech. And that's, that's so much easier to do. Uh, by the way, I, um, uh, I have, there, there were periods in my life where I delivered at least a one hour speech every week for uh 15, 20 years, every week for 15, 20 years. So I've done a lot of public speaking. Uh, I was a professional trainer. I did nothing but training for my company for a good 10 years. So, I mean, I, I, I'm very, very adept at public speaking. <coughs> uh, all right, so let's talk about some of the solutions to, uh, to this debilitating fear that can derail your career. Uh, first of all, there's a there's a, a Bible verse, and, and for those of you that are not Christian or not uh, don't like the Bible, don't worry. I, I mean, I, I'm not preaching any gospels here, but but the verse has um, the verse has significance for for what we're talking about here. Love casts out 
fear. That is 1 John 4, 18. Love casts out fear. And remember this, false expectations that appear to be real. Fear. Uh, how do you get rid of fear? Love. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? Let me tell you about one of my favorite performers of all time. And I never saw him perform because he was before my time. But Howard Thurston was the leading magician in the golden age of magic. And he used to, uh, you know, he had a, the, the full-scale illusion show. He had the, the big show. I mean, you're talking about a two-, three-hour program that he did every single day. Every single day. You'd think that year in and year out, he'd get used to performing a little bit. But no, Howard Thurston experienced stage fright just like you and me. So he would stand backstage, and the audience would come in, and they'd be sitting in the seats, and he would, he would peer through the curtain peer through the curtain, and he would say, over and over again, he would say, I love my audience. I love my audience. He'd see people come in, I love my audience. I love my audience. And it focused him on what he was there to do. You see, you see what fear can do? Fear can take your focus off of your performance art, off of what you're trying to give, and put it on you. So it becomes a very selfish thing. It becomes all about me. It's not all about you. It's about what the service that you're providing for that paying audience member. That's what it's about. And if you can focus your attention on what you're giving, on your service, it's, it becomes less about you and, and the tension and anxiety less. And that's why he did it. So, so it's, it's a great way to lessen your anxiety, to shift your focus away from you and away from your problems and onto that person who needs to be entertained that day. Now, if you're delivering a speech, you have, you have important information that you need to relay to that person that's going to help them. If you're, if you're an entertainer, you're doing a magic show, you're going to lift them out of whatever circumstances they're in for those moments. You're going to lift them out. You're going to give them hope. You're going to give them a sense of joy, a sense of wonder. That's a beautiful thing. And if you can focus on your mission, all the other stuff seems uh, less important by comparison. So, so think about that. Love casts out fear. Another thing you want to do is acknowledge that you feel it. Don't deny it. Don't say, oh, you know what? Uh, this entertainer or that entertainer or this speaker, they never seem to be anxious. They never seem to be anxious. That's a key point. You know, that, that comedian uh, backstage at the Johnny Carson, The Tonight Show, he was pretty anxious. But when he walked out in front of that, that audience and took that microphone, you couldn't tell that. You couldn't see it. And uh, that's acting. That's what that is. That's acting. And you need to be a good actor. Uh, your audience doesn't, doesn't want to see you nervous. Uh, and that, that might make you more nervous, but they, you, know, you, you can learn to, to overcome and, and project that air of confidence and ease uh, like so many great entertainers do. But it doesn't mean they're not nervous. It doesn't mean that the butterflies aren't driving them crazy inside. Um, because they are. Acknowledge your fear. Own it. Say, yes, yes, I feel it. Yes. It tells me that I'm doing the right thing. It tells me that I'm on the right track. Own it. Feel the fear and do it anyway. That's courage. That's courage. It, it doesn't take a, a brave person to look public speaking in the eye and run the other way. It doesn't take a brave person to do that. It takes courage to prepare your speech, to prepare your show, and get in front of an audience and deliver. It takes courage to do that. So if, if you're in that spot, if you're watching this video because you want tips on public speaking, you want tips on how to overcome these kinds of fears, you're going to be afraid. But do it anyway. And you'll be so proud you did and so glad you did. You will know what victory feels like when you're at the other end of that thing. So feel the fear and do it anyway. Another thing, be prepared. Be prepared. There is no such thing as over-prepared. It just doesn't happen. You know, when, when I'm getting ready for a show, uh, speeches are a little different. As I said, there's a difference between performance art and speech delivery. It is. It is. Um, 
when I'm getting ready for a show, man, I, th there, I'm always looking for that rehearsal time. Now, my shows run about an hour, so I'm looking for, you know, it takes, it takes uh, a while to set up, it takes a while to break down. So I'm looking for a, a two to three hour block of time that I can dedicate to, to that rehearsal so I can walk through that show. And, uh, and I'll do that more and more and more as show day approaches. Now, some guys perform every day, so they're not doing that. But, uh, but no, for me, rehearsal is everything. So, so I get out there and I'm doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. And I will, I will often, if I have time in the day, now some, some shows are early in the day, I don't have time. But if I have time, I'll, I'll do a rehearsal during the day before the show. Uh, and so when I walk in there, it's, it's, I've already done it. I've already done it. So <coughs> be prepared. Confidence comes from mastery and from experience. Now, you know, if this is your first time speaking, if this is your first time performing, you don't have that experience. But you do have the opportunity to master your material. Now, you know, I, I think you should work with a script always, even if you're doing public speaking. But I don't think you should be a slave to it. You, you shouldn't uh, be, you know, what's my, you, that's not the way to present. Um, you work from a script. I'm going to go over this in a minute, by the way, outlines and things like that, cue sheets. Uh, but you, you need to be completely familiar with your material, very comfortable with it. Uh... And that's preparation. And, and a lot of your anxiety is a warning to you. Your body is telling you that you're not prepared, that there's more work to be done. The, the more you rehearse, the more you practice, the more time you put in, the better you're going to feel, the more at ease you're going to feel. So do that. Prepare. Know your material so well that you can do it on autopilot. Here's another thing, too, that I've learned. If you're doing all the rehearsing and you're doing all the preparing and you're still anxious, I mean, very anxious. I mean, you're going to be anxious, but there's a difference in the level of anxiety. I have found that, that there's something in the show or there's something in my presentation that just isn't, I think the word is congruent. It's just not right with me. And if I can identify what that is and get it out of the show, bam, I, I feel so much better. I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a routine that I love, and, and I, I love it because uh, Osterlin does it. He does a bank night uh, routine. Now, well, here's what he does. He has, um, he has envelopes, and uh, they're, they're bank envelopes, they're money envelopes. And he tells his audience, you know, I have... I have money in one of these envelopes and the other envelopes is just a, a blank piece of paper or whatever it might be. And so he goes through this with it and the audience members are selecting envelopes and he's left with one and, and audience members open their envelope and they don't have anything and he has the money. And the way Osterlin presents it, it's, it's pretty entertaining, I think. And I, I love watching him do it. And so uh, I, I saw... I saw Paul Daniels do a very similar routine. And by the way, the bank night's been around forever. It, it precedes Osterlin. It precedes Paul Daniels. But I saw Paul Daniels do the same routine. And Paul Daniels is giving out prizes. Uh, he's giving... So people aren't feeling like they don't... Now, by the way, Osterlin gave, uh, gave uh, lottery scratch-off tickets as well. So he, he gave value. That's what I'm saying. He gave value. There, there was, he did keep the money, but he gave value. And, and so Paul Daniels did this. And Paul Daniels gave uh, stuffed animals and all sorts of things uh, that, that audience members were delighted with. So I thought I could get away with this as well. I thought, you know, I'll do, I'll do a bank night routine and, and I'll give away things and audience members will be pleased. But at the end of the day, that routine is the performer wins and the spectator loses, basically. Basically. It's very hard to get around that basic uh, narrative. <clears throat> and so that, that was in the back of my head. I, I'd rehearsed this routine so well. I, I, had, I had the script down. I had my jokes down. I had everything down exactly the way I wanted it. But as the show date got closer... I'm talking about the night before the show. I'm thinking, you know what? This just doesn't feel right to me. I don't. And I took it out. 
and I, I, I needed, uh, I mean, I've got lots of material. It does not hard for me to pop another, another uh, piece in, but I put another piece in that involved using a, uh, using a pendulum to find an object. Now it's the same sort of theme, right? Because what you have is you have, um, one object of value and other objects that are not of value, but instead of the performer ending up with it, the spectator is able to locate it herself with her own abilities. And so it, she looks like the champion. And so I, I put this uh, routine in and I felt great about the show. So um, sometimes your anxiety is telling you something's wrong. And, and if that's the case, change it, change it. I don't care how close you are to showtime, change it, get it out. Uh, so so um, tweak your presentation until it feels right to you, until, you, until you're saying to yourself, I'm proud of this. You need to be proud of what you're doing. You need to be proud of your show or proud of your speech. And if you're not proud of it, change it. Change it until you are. You should be proud of every single moment that you spend in front of an audience. You should have thought about it. It should be intentional. It should be scripted. And you should be proud of it. And if you're not proud of it, if there's something that you think, oh, this is a filler routine, or this is weak, or this joke doesn't quite fly, but I'm going to try it anyway, get it out of the show. Get it out of the show. Dump it. There, there's not. Hey, listen, I've heard professional magicians say this to me. If you spent $2,000 on a prop, but that prop isn't working for you, if it's not working for your personality, get it out of the show. It's not worth damaging your body. It's not worth damaging your audience. It's not worth the damage it's going to do to your show to keep something in there just because whatever. Uh, it's just not worth it. Get it out of the show. So tweak that show until it feels right. You need to believe in your material. Uh, if you don't, if you're not having fun with it, if you don't believe in it, get it out of the show. Uh, another thing that I like to do is I, I ask a lot of questions about the audience. You know, I, uh, what are the ages? Um, uh, are there any disabilities I need to be aware of? Uh, uh, tell me about the audience. I, I, I try the person who's booking me. I try to get as much material as I can, uh, much information as I can from the from the booking agent so that I know who, who I'm performing for. If you know, uh, well, if you, for example, when I go back and I do a second show, a third show, a fourth show for the same audience, it gets so much easier. I know exactly who I'm performing for. I know exactly what they want. I know exactly what they respond to. Uh, and that, that's a ticket to easy street. It really is when you know who you're, who you're working for. It's hard to do that. Uh, you know, I, I get, I get called into situations. I have no idea sometimes. And you know, the, the, some of the worst things that can happen is, uh, you don't plan for a certain uh, disability. For example, uh, you, you've got, you've got routines in your show that involve a, a lot of audience participation. You want to get people up out of the audience. You want to get them involved on stage. But you get to the show and most of the people are, are either unable or unwilling to get up there. So now you get a little bit of a spot. So the more you know about the audience going in, the, the better that you are going to be. Arrive early. Arrive early. Uh, don't, you know, if you want to, if you want to uh, have anxiety, get to the show on time. Do not get to the show on time. Get there early. Let me run through a few things with you. You know, I, I, I am a professional in the human resource business and I go to seminars all the time and I present seminars all the time. Something that drives me crazy. Now, here's, here's again, here's the difference between a performance artist and a public speaker. Public speakers roll in and, you know, they're used to doing, they're, they're touring all over the country and they roll in and they have a, a flash drive what they have and they have their PowerPoint presentation on their flash drive and so now they're depending on the show or, or the promoters or the sponsors to have a laptop to have a screen to have an LCD projector to have a microphone and all that stuff might be written into your contract you know I need this I need this I need this because I you know I hire speakers too they come into my place and speak 
and they come in with a flash drive. You know, I have no pity for them. No pity for them if something goes wrong. Uh, you need, you are responsible for your show. You're responsible for whether or not people can hear it, whether or not people can see it. Uh, you need to come prepared and you need to come early. Now, if you are there early, let's say you have the contract and it says you got to provide all the materials. So you show up and you're, you're a half an hour early or you're an hour early. You have time to make adjustments to their equipment if you need to. If you show up 10 minutes before showtime and the sound system's on the blink or you can't, you know, you, they can't get internet access or whatever it is, uh, you know, your anxiety is going to go up. You're not going to do your best work. And I've seen this. I, I've gone to seminars and the speaker is fooling around with, uh, with, uh, with tech stuff 15 minutes into the time that he or she is supposed to be speaking. That is not acceptable. That is not acceptable. And don't you ever do it. Get there early, be prepared, bring your materials, and get to work on time. Uh, it's that easy. It will reduce your stress, and it will send a message of professionalism to your audience. Arrive early. Now, let me go over a few, uh, a few very specific symptoms and what you can do about them. When, when you are anxious, your pulse is going to race and what's going to happen is you're going to forget to breathe. As silly as that sounds, you're going to stop breathing. When, when you are caught in the trap of fear, you stop breathing. So here's what you do. Breathe. That's what you do. I've seen speakers do this, and I've done it too. You, you step, you step aside someplace, and you breathe. Take a nice deep breath in. Fill your lungs. Boy, you'll be amazed how much better you feel because you don't notice. You don't notice when you're uh, when you're all nervous and tense. You don't notice that you've stopped breathing, and it's no wonder that you get a little dizzy because your your brain's not getting oxygen. So. Um, Intentional breathing, deep breathing, you've probably heard this before, but you might not know why. That's why, folks, uh, when, when you're anxious, you stop breathing. Another thing that when, when your heart's racing, okay, your mouth dries out. So now you sound like this to your audience because your mouth is bone dry. It sounds ridiculous. Uh, what do I do? You know, I, I have a, a Aquafina or a Dasani or some other bottled water with me. It's not, um, <clears throat> it's not cold. It's always room temperature. I find that they, you know, when you're, when you're hot and your vocal cords are hot, uh, you don't want to put something freezing cold on top of that. It just, ugh, no, it doesn't work. So you want, you want your water, you want to have water. And by the way, um, my, my pastor delivers five messages on a weekend. It's amazing. It's an amazing thing to watch this guy do. Um, but he keeps, a, he keeps a glass of water uh, under the pulpit. And he'll stop and he'll take a little sip and then he'll go on. Nothing wrong with that. It keeps you focused. It, 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 it lubricates, uh, so uh, keep the water nearby, sip it as often as you need to, it will save you. It really, really will. The other thing that, and this is more for performance artists than it is for public speakers, but it might help you too if you're, if you're doing public speaking. Trembling hands, uh, trembling, trembling knees, you know. Uh, when you're nervous, you literally do this. It's called the shakes. For, for lack of a better term, you shake. Uh, you don't really want your audience to see that. Um, because, you know, if you're, you're doing this, your audience is saying, oh. Uh, and now, instead of, instead of entering into your message, <clears throat> or instead of receiving your, your gift of entertainment the way you intend it, most people are going to be worried about you. They're going to be concerned about you. They've been in these situations themselves. They know what it feels like, and you're reminding them of that. So they're, they're, it's not that they're not going to be with you. They are with you. 
Um, but you don't want them feeling anxious for you. You want them to be relaxed. You want them to be comfortable. So you want to get a handle on this, not necessarily for you, but for your audience. You don't want to telegraph that you're nervous by, by shaking and quivering like that. Uh, the way I manage it is, uh, it, it, I don't know if you know what the word blocking means. I've used the word blocking a few times, but it means that, that your body movements are pre-planned basically. Uh, you know where you're going to stand. You know how you're going to handle your arms. You know exactly what your posture is going to be at any given time during the presentation. <clears throat> That's basically blocking. So if you know that you have a tendency, and I, by the way, I don't really have this tendency. Um, when I'm really nervous, and that does happen occasionally, my hands will quiver a little bit. But for the most part, I don't have the tendency. So it's not a big problem with me. But, but uh, nevertheless, I do plan out my movements carefully so that I'm not holding something like this. You know, if, if you hold something like this, you, you give yourself the opportunity to shake. I don't give myself that opportunity. Now, uh, if, if you've chosen to be what I call a, a manipulation performer, that is you're doing uh, card manipulations or billiard balls or thimbles or something like that, uh, this is something you have to give a lot of thought to because uh, your hands are more or less everything when you are doing that kind of performance art. So you, you have to... Uh, you have to be very comfortable. I'm going to get to some uh, what I would call progressive exposure in a few minutes uh, that will help you. If you decided you wanted to be a, a manipulator and you want to manipulate cards, billiard balls, thimbles, uh, I'll give you some tips about that, about progressively increasing uh, the amount of tension that you're able to handle at any given time will help with that as well. But, but blocking is really important to reducing the, uh, the shakes. Uh, the other thing that people complain about often is, is sweating perspiration. It's warm in here today. It's, a, it's, a, it's May 18th and it's hot out and it's humid. So, so I'm having some issues with heat myself. Um, one thing that, that uh, again, going back to preachers, uh, you know, you go into a church it's, it's, it's 80 degrees outside, it's 90 degrees outside, you walk into the church and it's 65, Ugh, 65, and so you have to bring your winter coat. I, I've never really liked that, but I, I, I know why it's happening, because the, the preacher who is often the pastor, who is often the head of the church, is lowering the, uh, the temperature so that he or she is comfortable in, in the pulpit. Uh, rather than the audience member, and, and that happens quite a bit um, because they don't want to be perspiring up there. Uh, you know, but, but here's what you can do, though. You can, you can dress appropriately. Uh, you don't have to wear necessarily uh, you know, a vest or a sport jacket. Uh, there are lots of politicians who, uh, who, are, who get rid of their jacket sometimes during, during presentation because they're, they're trying to combat that, that problem. But with sweaty hands in particular, my, my hands, again, I don't, I don't experience that. My, my hands are dry almost all the time. But I used to be a gymnast in high school, and we used to put uh, powder on our hands to take the sweat out of them so that we weren't slipping on apparatus. Same principle, folks. Uh, you can powder your hands, and, and it will take the sweat out so you're not, uh, you're not getting your props sweaty and stuff like that. So anyway, that's just a little bit there. Now... One of the problems that I do have, uh, that I do suffer with, is, uh, is nausea, diarrhea. And again, I'm sorry, folks, I'm sorry. But you know what? I, I've been to, I can't even count the number of, of how to be a better speaker presentations I've been to. And they cover stage fright and they cover uh, fear punk speaking, but they never talk about what I'm trying to talk about today. Uh, the very practical, down-to-earth, nitty-gritty stuff. Uh, my biggest problem, my biggest obstacle in performing in public speaking and in, in, in the fear of public speaking and, and the stage fright is nausea and, and diarrhea. And if I didn't talk about it, I'd be doing you a, d a disservice because you might be experiencing that too. You have gastro problems when you are in the grip of fear. 
almost everybody does. Some people are constipated, some people have diarrhea. This is why your lifestyle needs to, if you're going to engage in public speaking and in performance art, you're going to need to commit to certain lifestyle choices. You're, you're going to need to eat healthy. I'm sorry, you are, you know, forget the Twinkies, forget the sugar, forget the chocolate. Um, you're going to, you go as close to a vegetarian diet as you can get, the better off you're going to be. Uh, meat, as delicious as it is, and I'm not a true vegetarian because I eat meat, but but I'm careful about it around showtime. Meat goes through the digestive system slower. And it, 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 it binds you up a little bit. And that's not what you want. Uh, you want everything flowing freely. So you want to gravitate toward a higher fiber diet. You want uh, whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. You want lots and lots of water. And I'm talking 8 to 10 8 ounce glasses a day. Every day. That's your lifestyle. The other thing you want is great cardiovascular fitness. So uh, you don't have to be a marathon runner to achieve this. If you walk briskly for a half an hour every day, half an hour to 45 minutes, you will achieve uh, what I would consider to be adequate cardiovascular fitness to help you deal with the nervousness that you're going to have to deal with. So that's really part of what I'm... I'm getting at, but you know what? I did all those things. I began eating a healthy diet. I I I walk every single day. I, I am cardiovascularly fit. I, I have a good diet, and yet I still had debilitating problems on show day. So what happened? Well, I, I started seeing... I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to give you medical advice, but I started seeing a gastroenterologist to address some of these issues. And um, the doctor told me to start using Miralax on a daily basis. Miralax is a, uh, it's, it's the brand name. There are generic available. But what this does is it keeps everything flowing. And that's what you need to do. You need to keep everything flowing so that you're not... Uh, you know, just to be as graphic as I possibly can, you don't want to be sitting at your show place or at your presentation location in the bathroom for a half an hour before you have to go on. You don't want to do that. And, and you won't do that if you follow this regime. You know, I'm sorry this is graphic stuff, but you know what? You're not hearing it anywhere else. So hopefully... Uh, Hopefully it helps. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's my secret, folks. It really is. And it's made all the difference in the world. It has. Uh, so, so think about that. The other thing that will happen when you're, when you're dealing with anxiety is you get tense. Oh, you get tense. You get tense. And this, you know, I, you've probably seen me do this, right? You've seen me do this. I, ha I have arthritis. And I also have uh, nerve issues and so so uh, I, I I tend to be like the Tin Man in the Wizard of Oz you know if I stand still too long I freeze up so um, so I got I got to keep my my muscles stretched um, when I studied Kung Fu uh, they, they they put a lot of emphasis on stretching and the whole time and, and it was over a year the whole time I was studying Kung Fu I never froze up I never had arthritis flare-ups. I never had uh, seriatic nerve issues. I just didn't because, you know, I went there every single day and we went through, ah, 30 minutes of stretching before we ever got to the, the kung fu stuff. You know, we, we get through all the stretching. Uh, stretching is indispensable when you're dealing with tension, uh, tension in your muscles related to nerves. It really is. So, so think about getting yourself uh, uh, on a stretching program. And that, that's not something you do pre-show. It's something you do every day. Uh, you, you, want, you want to stretch often and stretch frequently. And, and so when you get to the show, you can, you can just kind of, kind of go through some of those motions to get the, the tension out, physically out of your muscles. Um, the other thing <coughs> that 
is a problem with fear is, is that it builds up all this energy inside. And if you've ever experienced, you know what I'm talking about. You have all this energy. Uh, so I'm going to give you a couple of, a one new age uh, uh, solution and one very practical solution. Brisk walking will expend that energy. And again, it's not something you just do, do show day. You want to do it on a regular basis. But, but cardiovascular exercise will burn some of that energy off. Uh, and that's very good. Now, that the, but you don't want to go for a brisk walk 10 minutes before your show. You, you don't want to do that. I mean, it would help, but you don't want to do that. Uh, so there's this, uh, this exercise that most people would refer to as grounding. Here's the way grounding works, okay? You want to take a meditative state. And if you don't meditate, look into it. Uh, there's, you, know, you, you read books and you see videos, and it makes it look very strange and peculiar. It's not. Basically, with meditation is you want to calm yourself. You want to you want to just kind of regulate your thoughts. Yeah, in fact, you want to uh, to not allow just to allow things to occupy your mind. Just be fully present in the moment. Uh, a meditative state means you're clear. You're not you're not thinking about your show. You're not thinking about your anxiety. You're clear. You just don't have those thoughts going on. So you take a meditative state. And you feel this energy going on inside of you. You sit very relaxed. Your feet are flat on the ground. You visualize your legs going down into the earth. You might be on the fifth floor or the seventh floor. It doesn't make any difference. Visualize your legs going down like roots of a tree. Going down into the earth. And then take that energy, all that anxiety, and let it run down those roots and into the earth. Whew, will you feel good? Uh, that is centering. For, that grounding, actually, is what that's called. That's called grounding. Uh, grounding and centering are two different things. Uh, centering is pulling everything into your center. Uh, but I want you to ground. I want you to ground all that energy so you're not carrying it around with you. Uh, you will feel great when you do that. Uh, that that's uh, the, if you if I didn't give you enough explanations, simply Google it, or you know you're on YouTube, so go up there and and type in grounding, and and look for somebody that can do a good job uh, presenting that to you. But it's 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 very helpful indeed. Uh, <clears throat> the um, Something I want to get to uh, also is, is the use of a cue card. As you probably noticed, I'm using cue cards. You may not have noticed that I'm actually looking at them, but I am. Something that, that I have always, I've done for years, and, and I don't know, I'm not going to say I'm the originator of it, I'm not, but, but uh, I don't know very many people who actually do this. Um, that's the cue card I'm using today. It's an outline. It's nothing more. It's, it doesn't have uh, paragraphs of information. It's just an outline. What I've done is I've given this outline major headings. You see? Major headings. And I've highlighted those. So that as I'm speaking to you, all I need to do is glance. That's it. I got it. Glance and I can see the major heading. Now I've rehearsed enough so that I have it in my head enough. I don't have to read this. But I want to make sure that I cover important points. I don't want to forget anything. I don't want to leave anything out. So I use an outline. Now, if you're doing a speech presentation, lots of people today are using PowerPoint. That's your outline, okay? You put the PowerPoint slide up. You know where you're going. You know what you're supposed to say. Uh, here's, the, here's the issue. When you're in a performance situation, the anxiety's going, the energy's going, uh, you have a tendency to go blank. You know, you have a tendency to go, oh, guys, I can't remember what I'm supposed to do. You might have the, the best memory in the world, but in that stressful situation, bam. Whew, you know, it's gone. Whew, gone. So, um, and I'll tell you what, I always work with a paper outline, even if I'm using PowerPoint. You know why? Because electronics fail. And if your electronics fail and you don't know where you're going or what you're supposed to be doing, uh, 
boy, does that look unprofessional, huh? So um, even if you're working with PowerPoint uh, or you're working with some other electronic presentation, keep an outline handy, folks. Uh, this is a speech that I'm delivering when I'm doing a show. Uh, most of the time I have a performance space that's me in the audience, okay? And then I have uh, a little table over here, generally uh, to my right side. And on the table there are often props. Uh, we can talk about why I do that in another video. You don't want to, you don't want to do this when you're trying to get a prop. You don't want to, you don't want to turn your back to your audience. And so being able to reach and pull and you know, I used to have an assistant that would bring me things, but I don't have that anymore. So I, I have things lined up. And my cue sheet is laying on that table. So uh, when, I, when I reach over, you know, all I have to do is glance down. And, and it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, just a, it's just a handy thing to do. And if you want more information on this, um, I'd be happy to help you out there. That's the use of a cue sheet. Now, there's one last thing that I want to leave you with as far as uh, what you should be doing about your stage fright or your fear of public speaking. Um, this is another biblical verse. I don't know exactly where it is. It's in the Old Testament somewhere, the, the Torah. Um, Despise not the day of small beginnings. Uh, you'll be doing yourself a favor if you don't overreach. Um, start out... If you've never done a speech before, if you've never delivered a speech before, think about Toastmasters. Get in there and you'll be delivering uh, five-minute speeches, ten-minute speeches. These are not difficult things to put together. Uh, they'll give you very structured uh, outlines to work from. So you read over the outline, you do the assignment, you come in, you deliver the speech. It's a great way to get started if, you've, if you're just not used to public speaking. And by the way, for those of you who aspire to be magicians, learn to be a public speaker first. Learn to be an actor first. Then add performance magic to it. As I've said, performance art is so much more difficult than public speaking. You'll be glad you did. So, um, but... This is so important because when I get into a situation where the anxiety, I'm, I know my show, so it's not that, it's not that I have material there that's not quite right with me, not that, I've got a great show, I know that, but for some reason my anxiety is, you know, way through the roof, sometimes it's because I'm overreaching and I, I've got, uh, I've gotten myself into an environment that just, I'm just not ready for. Now, you know, you hear all the time, uh, the comfort zone is where dreams go to die. You hear that kind of thing all the time. You do. And, and they're trying to get you out of your comfort zone, and naturally so. If you never get out of your comfort zone, you will never grow. But, get out of your comfort zone in strategic ways. You know, if, if you overreach... What, what I don't want you to do is get into a situation that's more than you can handle and fail. Because if you do that, the next time is going to be three times as worse. So I want you to take small steps, small incremental steps to get where you want to be. If you want to be the next David Copperfield and you want to do a national television show and you want to... You want to have your own show in Las Vegas. That's great. But don't start there. Start with your local show. Start with your local market. Uh, if you've never done a magic show before, call up the Kiwanis Club or call up the Rotary or call up the, uh, the local Masonic Lodge or call up the local uh, uh, retirement center and see if you can get in there and perform. Uh, get experience performing in front of people and then and then build on that experience and and keep going uh, that's just a little advice uh, that 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 I, I truly believe in um, 
you know, my anxiety does come from a lot of different things, but overreaching is one of them. So folks, uh, that's my 10 cents worth on the fear of public speaking and stage fright. I really hope you found this helpful. Uh, I am not finished. Uh, I'm going to continue to work on this. I'm going to continue to do research on it. You know, there are there's a medical component here. There is a psychological component here, and I'm going to get into more detail in those areas as well. And uh, we're going to beat this thing. You know, you and I, we're going to beat this thing. Don't don't let fear stop you. Uh, go for your dream. Go for your dream. You deserve it. And you know what? The world deserves it too. We need what you have to offer. Why would you withhold it from us? Especially, especially because of fear. Uh, give us your dream. And we'll love you for it. Have a great day, everyone. I'll see you next time.